Hello again and welcome to module four of our series about playing golf croquet. In this module we're going to be looking at faults, how they occur and possible remedies. Now it's important to recognize that the new fifth edition rules uh, have totally changed our outlook on faults. A whole series of uh, faults which used to be recognized called non-striking faults has been totally abolished. So all the faults which we now uh, recognize are what used to be called striking faults. But because there is no longer that differentiation between non-striking and striking, they're all simply called faults nowadays. So what is a fault? A fault is an error um, that happens during the striking period and if you think back to module one the striking period we defined as the uh, length of time between when a striker takes up position to, to strike a ball and then moves away under control so it's quite a small narrow um, envelope of time so what has happened to all those errors that we used to regard as non-striking faults well Basically, they've been reclassified as interferences. So, for example, I'm going to play the red ball, and as I'm moving into position, I accidentally move two other balls. Under the old rules, that would have been a non-striking fault, and I would have forfeited my shot on the red ball. Now, that is regarded as an interference. It was an accidental error, and so those balls are put back where they were, and both players have to agree on where they were and then I play my red ball as I should have done in the first place. The same goes if I very gently move a ball with my foot before I've actually taken up striking stance. The only time that a fault counts now is after after I've actually taken up the stance. Now if I were to do take up my stance and then move my foot and move the black ball, that would be a fault. So all the other errors that we used to identify as non-striking faults, for example, if a ball accidentally hits a player um, while a shot is being played, are simply regarded as interferences and the players come to their own best decision as to where the balls would have ended up. Again, if I take up stance and then accidentally touch the black ball with the mallet, once I've taken up stance, that would be a fault. Another sort of fault um, which can occur in situations like this where the ball has come through the hoop but not very far is often known as a push shot. Here it's difficult to get the mallet in to, to, to strike the ball cleanly and there's a danger of doing that and that is seen in the rules as maintaining contact with the ball for uh, longer than normal. You must be very careful when playing balls where another ball is in proximity. You must not use the beveled edge of the mallet. So for example, if I were to play that red like that, that would be a fault. How can I play it? Well, I can play it of course from either side, or I could come round the other side of the hoop and just do a little stop shot which would move the opposing ball out of the way but still leave my ball with a possible hoop shot. When playing a shot you must not touch the head of the mallet with your finger at any point or any part of your hand so even if your finger was simply touching the, the head of the mallet that would be a fault and of course you're not allowed to do that sort of thing nor are you allowed to kick the mallet. That would be a fault. One of the things you've got to be careful of when balls are quite close together, as these two are, uh, around four or five centimetres apart, is not doing a, a double tap. And a double tap is when you strike the, in this case, the red ball with the mallet, then the mallet follows through, the red ball hits the blue ball, and the mallet hits the red ball again. And I'll show you what that looks like for real. So, 
So how do we know it was a double tap? It's not the sound normally. It's the, the relative distance that the two balls travel. If it's not a double tap, the object ball, and in other words, in this case, the blue ball, should travel at least eight times further than the striker's ball. Now, in this case, as you saw, the uh, blue ball went way down the lawn, but the red ball went way past the peg, so perhaps half as far. So that was definitely a double tap. So how do we not do a double tap? Well, first of all, if you're in a situation in the game where you think that your opponent may play a double tap, you should mark or have the balls marked. So I'm going to use blue markers and red markers either side of each ball. And the point of that is if your opponent does play a double tap, you, the uh, owner of, say, the blue ball, has the opportunity to put the balls back where they were at the start of the shot. So I'm going to play, essentially, a stop shot. That's, what, that's all it is. And this will not be a double tap. So as you can see, the striker's ball, the red, has gone roughly a mallet's length and the object ball, the blue, has gone about 15 yards down towards hoop five. So that was definitely not a double tap. A particular double tap situation is when balls are very close together um, and if they are less than four millimetres apart, you are not allowed to hit down the centre line of the balls. If, this is the, if the red ball is the striker's ball, you must not hit it like that. You can hit it at any angle greater than 60 degrees to the line of the two balls. Provided, of course, you don't hit the blue ball with your mallet. But you can't hit like that because high-speed photography has shown that unless you do a really brilliant uh, stop shot, you're almost certain to do a double tap. In the situation where balls are actually touching, then you can do what you like, because you're not going to do a double tap. In this little sequence about faults, we've, we've looked at a number of faults that can happen, but what is the remedy? Essentially, the non-offending side has the choice of leaving the balls where they stand after the fault, or putting them back to the place they were before the fault occurred, and then that player plays. So in other words, the uh, side that created the fault loses its turn. But if in the course of a fault, the striker scored a point for the non-offending side, that point will stand. But if he scores a point for himself, that point will not stand. If a point has been scored for the opposition in the course of a fault shot, the opposition may not then choose to replace the balls uh, after the uh, hoop has been scored. The balls must remain where they stand. A turn can only begin to be valid when all other balls on the uh, court have stopped moving. What happens if someone plays while another ball is moving? It's called overlapping play and we'll have a look at it now. We are for hoop 12 and black has cleared yellow towards corner 4. My opponent, Keir, has forgotten that yellow has yet to play. Well, as you saw, Keir scored what could possibly have been a match-winning hoop, but unfortunately it doesn't count. Because both balls are moving at the same time, the blue is counted as being overlapping, and so the blue ball goes back to the place that it started. And then Keir is deemed to have played his shot, which is a fairly tough outcome, and so it would then be Red's turn to play. 
So Keir loses his turn on the blue ball. We've looked at several faults. Here are a couple of shots which people may think are faults, but which are not faults. So, I aimed to hit the ball, but completely missed. It's known as an air shot, and in association croquet, that would count as one shot, and that would be that. But in golf croquet, because I didn't touch the ball, it simply doesn't count. And so I can continue again and play the shot. Now here's something slightly different. I didn't tend to hit the ball in my casting, but I did. But that does count as a shot. In association croquet, it would not count as a shot. So just two things to be aware of there, of differences between the two forms of croquet. In golf croquet, all the players are each other's referees, and they should keep a watch on what their opponents are doing and making sure that they are actually abiding by the rules. Only in very formal matches, for example in certain tournaments and championships, is there a third party referee. At any point in the game, if a questionable shot is going to be played, a player should ask for it to be watched by a third party, perhaps a, a qualified spectator, a, a referee spectator, or do it himself. And there are various situations where this can occur. We've looked at, for example, double taps. This is a situation where you might want to call a referee or have a shot watched. Here we are at hoop five, and the yellow ball is its not quite touching the wire, but it's not far off. And what you're not allowed to do is to crush that ball through the hoop, or attempt to, in that sort of fashion. Well, you saw what happened. So in this sort of situation, the correct shot would be to play away from the the hoop, but quite gently possibly, just to get the ball to sit in the hoop. We said that all players need to act as referees, or at least be prepared to act as referees, and in order to do that you need a small kit of parts, and uh, I carry mine around in a plastic bag in my pocket. Let's just have a look at what that contains. Well, first of all, some ball markers in various different colours, a divot repairer, and you can get those usually from a local golf club. A rubber band cut in two, and if you wish, but it's not essential, a coin to have one handy for, for tossing at the start of a game. So fairly basic things, but really every player needs to have them. And now we'll have a look at how to use them. The most likely case where you're going to have to mark balls is if you're playing a double banked games and, for example, here we are at hoop five and someone may be coming up to hoop five with another, ga uh, with another set of balls and you may need to, to mark the balls that you're using. You need, when marking a ball, to have a fixed point to refer to and the fixed point on all croquet lawns is the centre peg. And how do you mark balls? Well, first of all, never ever use a coin to mark a ball. If you put a coin on the lawn and forget to pick it up and then it gets into a lawn mower, it can do an awful lot of damage. So always, always use plastic markers. Uh, they're very cheap and uh, multicolored, so you can mark the correct ball with the correct color. Uh, the way to mark a ball and do this on every occasion, is to use the centre peg as your fixed point and then looking straight at the peg come through a diagonal across the ball and put the marker so that the edge of the ball and the edge of the marker appear to intersect when viewed from above. Then you can take the ball away if necessary and if you put it back again it will go back to within a millimetre of its original position. 
you may remember that when we looked at double taps, I marked the balls, and in that particular situation, there was no need to use the centre peg because the balls were being marked for their relative positions, one to each other. And in that case, I used uh, markers set across the balls in this situation here. So here it's quite clear where the balls are and where they might go back to if they have to be replaced after a fault. One of the potentially difficult decisions for a referee is to decide when a ball has actually run a hoop. Here we are at hoop 12, so we're going in that direction. Has this red ball run the hoop or not? Now, the rules say that you should be able to decide this by an, what the rules call an ocular test, in other words, by eye. So you need to get down this sort of level and line the ball up carefully across the, the uh, side face of the hoop here and decide whether or not there's any red showing on the playing side of the hoop. And if there is, then obviously it has not run the hoop. Now, one of the things that people tend to do in this situation is to run a mallet down the face of the hoop to see if it touches the ball. You should never, ever do that. Because, of course, if you do touch the ball, you will move it and thereby displacing the ball and thereby incorrectly uh, deciding whether or not the ball has run the hoop. So how do we do it if we need to? Well, normally, of course, uh, you, ca you can see quite clearly whether or not um, a ball has run the hoop, really. The difficulty sometimes comes with a white ball where if you're looking at across the hoop, white ball, white hoop, it can be a little difficult. So here's how you do it. So using your referee's kit rubber band, stretch the rubber band not too tightly across the base of the hoop and then slide it gently up the hoop. And I think you can see that the rubber band is flexing around the, the ball. Try that once more. The ball weighs a pound, so assuming the rubber band is not too tightly stretched, it will not move the ball. So that's the end of module four. Which I hope was informative for you about faults and uh, the new range of faults that we have. Uh, in module five, we're going to be looking at handicap play and how you can allocate and use extra strokes in the course of a game. <laughs>